This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform where entrepreneurs can easily create and customize their own personal or professional website. More on Squarespace later in the video. So hello and welcome to another episode of Biographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about Edward III, England's real-life King Arthur. And yes, I've listened to the feedback. Um, I, I got rid of the mic so I can touch my desk as much as possible. We're using a lav mic now, so hopefully you don't get any of that awkward feedback I've been um, uh, hearing from people. But also, I got a haircut. It might not look like I did, um, but I've got a very big head, you have to understand. Anyway, let's get to it. In the Middle Ages, people had developed an idea of what they thought a good king should be. While wisdom, good judgment, and honourable conduct were all considered important, what was considered to be most important was a king's ability to lead his troops on the battlefield. It is no coincidence then that most of the era's greatest kings also rank among its best military commanders. Of all of these, there was perhaps none better than England's King Edward III. And it's worth pointing out that over here in jolly old England, King Edward is the nickname for potatoes. I know, what a legacy that is. Certainly no king of his era was more respected or feared by his enemies than Edward. He routinely performed feats on the field of battle considered almost miraculous by his contemporaries. In the process, evolving the art of warfare itself by utilising the latest innovations in the technology and tactics designed to hurt people. His wars would help shape the course of European history for centuries afterwards, and his achievements in peace were no less significant, although much less interesting to talk about in a YouTube series. In fact, some historians have called Edward the father of the English nation. So cheers, dad, I suppose. Because thanks to him, England will begin to transform from a provincial backwater into a continental powerhouse that all the courts of Europe will be forced to respect. While the English themselves began to establish a unique national identity and distinct culture. I don't even know how to respond to that. <laughs> I consent English food is good. That, come out, beans on toast is top tier, come at me in the comments. Sacre bleu. Edward, above all things, considered himself to be a knight, bound by a code of chivalry that was considered extremely important in his time. Strange as it may seem to us today, he modelled himself off the mythical figure of King Arthur, and just like Arthur, Edward's life seemed to be a series of adventures from start to finish, each one more exciting than the last, and by the time his last adventure finally ended, his country and the world itself would never be the same again. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the story of Edward III is just how close he came to never really ruling at all. He was born November 13th, 1312 in Windsor Castle, 25 miles west of London. He was born in the purple, the eldest son of King Edward II, making him heir to the throne of England from the moment he was born. However, his royal inheritance would be threatened at a young age by the limitations of his father, Edward II, who was considered altogether a weak king lazy and indecisive and prone to placing too much executive power in the hands of his favourites. First, Piers Gaveston, who was murdered by political enemies six months before Prince Edward was born, and then Hugh Dispenser the Younger, which is, you know, a hell of a name, and his father, the Earl of Winchester. These favourites alienated and angered other members of the court by amassing increasing political power and wealth into their own hands, often at the expense of the other nobles. Civil war was the inevitable result. Queen Isabella, Prince Edward's mother, was a particular enemy of the dispensers, and in 1325 she separated from her husband, the king, taking up residence in the court of her brother, the King of France, when she began an affair with Roger Mortimer, an English baron who'd fought against the dispensers and was now living in exile over in France. Then she tricked her husband into sending their son to France as well, and then refused to return him back to England. Instead, she and Mortimer used the dowry they received from betrothing the prince to Philippa of Hainault to build an army of mercenaries in order to invade England and dispose King Edward and the dispensers. Royal authority completely collapsed in the wake of Isabella and Mortimer's invasion in September 1326, as all of Edward's many enemies flocked to their banner. Less than two months after landing, they had captured the king and his hated favourites, who were all brutally executed in typical British fashion. Edward himself was in prison, forced by Mortimer to abdicate in favour of his son in January 1327. One story posits that Edward was killed by having, and I quote, a red hot fire poker shoved right up his royal backside. Uh, this is judged to be highly unlikely by actual historians. It's a fun story though. The prince, meanwhile, was crowned King Edward III at age 14. His regency was dominated by Mortimer, now with the title the Earl of March, who began to accumulate vast amounts of land and wealth for himself, sparking more discontent among the nobles. Edward at times felt like little more than a figurehead, and it seemed unlikely that Mortimer was going to willingly relinquish power to him when he reached his majority. There were even rumours that Isabella was pregnant with Mortimer's child, and that he was making plans to seize the throne for himself.
On October 19th, 1330, a band of knights led by William Montagu, a close friend of Edward, snuck into Nottingham Castle and staged a coup d'etat, arresting Mortimer after a brief fight. The plan had been orchestrated by the king, who'd finally had enough of his mother's lover. Mortimer was executed for treason, while Isabella, to whom the king was somewhat attached, escaped with only a short period of house arrest. Edward was now king in his own right, and after a few years of consolidating power at home, he set out to prove himself on the international stage. Beginning with his northern neighbour, England and Scotland had been fighting each other for almost 40 years, stemming from Edward's grandfather's attempts to seize the crown of Scotland for himself in 1296. In 1327, however, Mortimer and Isabella had agreed to a treaty with the Scots which renounced all English claims on Scotland, a treaty Edward vehemently disagreed with. When a rival claimant to David II for the Scottish throne, Edward Belial, sought his help, King Edward decided that the time was right to renew hostilities and continue with the long-standing English tradition of attacking the Scottish. In 1333, Edward laid siege to the important border town of Berwick. His purpose was not just to capture the town, but to draw the Scottish army into battle where he could defeat them. It worked, because the Scottish were always like rowdy for a fight. I mean, I mean historically, like, I, I, I'm half Scottish. I, I can say that, right? Right? Anyway, like, they attacked him in the Battle of Halidon Hill and they were decisively defeated, the young king's first military victory. Halidon Hill is noted as being the first major demonstration of the power of a weapon that will come to define the English army, the longbow, a lesson Edward will remember in later engagements. Belial was set up as a client king of Scotland, having ceded large amounts of territory to Edward, but this would not bring peace to Scotland, and Belial would not sit on the throne for long. The major problem was the old alliance between Scotland and France, which had been renewed in 1326 by the French king. As long as the Scots could count on French support if they were attacked, Edward would never be able to truly assert his authority over Scotland, since he'd always have to contend with French attacks on his lands in Gascony, as well as raids and a possible invasion of England itself. The logical result of this was war with France, beginning in 1337. The traditional stories of the Hundred Years' War, which, fun fact, didn't last for a hundred years, between England and France began when King Edward challenged Philip VI over who should hold the title King of France. But the truth was, the two countries were already at war when Edward first made the claim in 1340. Philip had invaded English-held Gascony, attempting to eliminate the English monarch's possession of lands in France, and Edward had responded by attempting to build an alliance against Philip with the Low Countries and the Holy Roman Empire. One of the most important allies Edward wanted to win over was Flanders, which was economically dependent on English wool imports to fuel their textile trade. But Flanders owed its allegiance to the Kingdom of France, and if it rebelled against the Sovereign Lord, it could be placed under interdict by the Pope, cutting it off from the Catholic Church, and by extension, God himself. However, if Edward claimed to be the rightful King of France, Flanders could pay homage to him instead and be allied to England without risking the wrath of an angry deity. So that's just what Edward did, declaring Philip to be the usurper and quartering the arms of England and France together on his coat of arms. It's unlikely that he ever seriously considered attempting to seize the throne of France for himself. It would have been nearly impossible for one man to rule both kingdoms at the same time effectively. But still, he sent a message, and that message was, screw France. Today's top story. Reports have been flooding in of an easy and affordable solution to help you create an amazing personal or professional website. These reports are of course talking about Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. It doesn't matter if you're completely new to web design or a big brand looking to stand out. Squarespace is the best platform for you. Isn't that right, Joe? That's right, Annie. Its interface is so easy to use, and there are so many, many ways to customize everything. Whether you want to start blogging, create a business portfolio, or set up an online shop, Squarespace is there for you. Yay! Squarespace's next generation website design system, Fluid Engine, means creating your own website has never been so easy. With their drag and drop technology, you can add anything from text to images and video to links and newsletters. And all of it is infinitely customizable on both desktop and on mobile. Simply marvelous. Look at all these visitors to your website. Wouldn't it be great to keep all of them updated with vital announcements or upcoming sales? Then try new email campaigns by Squarespace. Just give your followers or customers the option to join your mailing list and BOOM! Look at how easy it is to cover all of your clientele! So are you saying that you credit careful analysis of data and analytics with your success? Indeed. 
Understanding your online traffic, where your visitors and sales come from, is the best way to figure out the most effective strategies for improvement. You can analyse what your most effective channels are and maximise your marketability based on your most popular content or top keywords. Squarespace allows you to do all of that and more. Fascinating. It's like I always say, analytics are like a wounded salmon. All they need are some raspberries to take flight. What? I don't have much time, so listen closely. Head to squarespace.com forward slash biographics and use the code biographics to get 10% off on your first purchase of a website or domain. Did you get that? Okay, I'm going in. Whatever his motivations, Edward's declaration was a shock to everyone from the Pope all the way down to the English Parliament. King Philip in particular was enraged. How dare this petty king who ruled half of an insignificant island on the outskirts of Europe, yep, challenge him, the ruler of the most powerful kingdom in all of Christendom, France. The Pope wasn't impressed either, but that was hardly a surprise. The papacy itself at the time was not based in Rome, but in Avignon in southern West France. The office was held by a series of Frenchmen throughout the time, and all the Pope's close advisors had close ties to the French crown. The first major battle between King Edward and the French occurred not on land, but at sea, when a large French naval fleet commanded by the Admiral and Constable of France blocked the entrance to the Zwine estuary of the English Channel, near the Flemish town of Stuys. They were attempting to stop Edward's own, much smaller fleet, which was transporting his army to the town of Bruges in order to stage an attack on France itself. European countries of this period had few purpose-built warships. The bulk of both fleets was made up from converted merchant vessels, known as cogs, which had been requisitioned from traders. Despite being, to put it diplomatically, heavily outnumbered and outgunned, Edward boldly attacked the French ships, which had chained themselves together in three battle lines to block the approach. This would prove to be their quite literal undoing as they were unable to manoeuvre when the battle began, allowing the English to pick them apart piece by piece. Once again, the superiority of the longbow was demonstrated as the English were able to pick off the French sailors at a distance from which they could not retaliate. The result was a massacre. Between 16 and 20,000 Frenchmen died, many of them drowned while trying to escape the English onslaught. The Marshal of France was beheaded, the constable hanged, both in revenge for prior French atrocities committed against English sailors, and because, again, it was English custom at the time to screw France whenever possible. Despite the sunny victory, Edward's campaign of 1340 would end in failure because the king ran out of what Cicero called the sinews of war, aka money. War was an expensive undertaking in the Middle Ages and Edward had borrowed heavily to pay for his army to bribe his allies and now he had no more gold to finance the invasion. Frustrated, he returned to England, literally sneaking out in the middle of the night to escape his creditors, vowing one day to return to finish what he'd started. Edward spent the next few years at home wrangling with Parliament over financial matters and, most importantly, the only action in the war was a limited English intervention in an ongoing succession battle over the Dukedom of Brittany in northwestern France, as well as almost continual border skirmishes with Scotland. Finally, in 1346, the King was ready to try again. This time, he had a well-supplied army of 15,000 men, a mandate from Parliament to finish the war that came with a guarantee of taxation to fund it and a determination to prove to Philip and all of Europe that this was a King to be reckoned with. Edward's army landed in Normandy in July and marched with impunity through the land of his ancestors, William the Conqueror. Towns that become famous centuries later as World War II battlefields were looted and burned by the English. And these are all French words I'm not sure how to pronounce, I'm going to try my best here. Cherbourg, Carentan, saint Lo, saint Mer, Elise and Cain. Well, at least he tried. The inhabitants of these towns were slaughtered in their hundreds, the laws of chivalry not applying to the commoners. This was a deliberate strategy by Edward known as Chevauché, a scorched earth raid of the path of destruction some 20 miles wide in the army's wake. It was designed to showcase the French king's weakness, to humiliate him and provoke him into a battle with English forces. But Philip was not stupid enough to leave the fortress of Rowan, waiting for the main French army to come up from Gascony to attack Edward with overwhelming force. He would not move even when the English came within two miles of Paris itself, prompting panic in the streets of the French capital. But Edward wasn't interested in besieging Paris, instead turning north, hoping to link up with a second army of Flemish allies. Finally, Philip pursued him, destroying the bridges on both the Seine and Somme rivers to try and trap Edward, but the English forcibly crossed the rivers anyway. Having crossed the whole of northern France, Edward now learned that his Flemish allies had given up and gone home, so there'd be no reinforcements, but he decided to stand and fight anyway, because 
the French, and they, the English, they, they fight a lot. Like cats and dogs. The position that the French army found the English in on August 26th had been carefully selected by Edward. He was on a sloping hill, his flanks anchored by the village of Wadicourt on his left and the larger town of Creasy on his right. He had also dug trenches in front of his lines to disrupt attacking horsemen. All of his men at arms would fight on foot, which appeared to the mounted French knights to be a distinct disadvantage. It was well known that infantry lines could not stand against a cavalry charge of armoured knights. For centuries, this had been the most devastating heavy weapon in medieval arsenals, or so they thought. Philip decided to attack that very same afternoon, rather than wait and give his army a chance to rest, which would have been far more practical. And no one's really quite sure why he did this, save for the fact that the English were there and he was spoiling for a fight. First to attack were the vanguard of mercenary archers from Genoa, hoping to soften up the English lines ahead of a French charge, but they were the first to come within range of the deadliest weapon in the English arsenal, the longbow. It is believed that each English archer could fire between 6 and 10 arrows per minute with an effective accuracy of up to 300 metres. This is significantly better than the Genoese crossbows. They were driven off within minutes and many were killed by the French themselves, who accused them of cowardice and treachery. Now the French knights charged, but they immediately ran into problems. It had just rained, so the ground was muddy and they were charging uphill into a storm of deadly arrow fire and they were hampered by the trenches the English had dug. The horses in particular, unprotected from the arrows that fell like snow, according to one chronicler, suffered terribly. Many of them collapsed, throwing their riders who were crushed or suffocated to death. By the time the charge reached the English lines, it retained little of its initial momentum and was repelled with heavy losses. That day, the French army made some 15 separate charges. Each time, they were driven back, not only by the hailstorm of arrows, but the confusing and terrifying sound of a cannon. Edward had fully embraced the martial potential of gunpowder, and this battle was one of the first in history to feature the deployment of cannons outside of a siege. King Philip had two horses shot out from under him and was nearly killed when an arrow hit him in the jaw. Finally, he was compelled to leave the field. In his wake was the ruined flower of French chivalry. In one afternoon, over 1,500 French and allied nobles had been killed. The dead included, but was not limited to, the King of Bohemia, the Duke of Lorraine, nine princes, ten counts, and two bishops. And no one bothered to count the number of common soldiers that died, but it's believed to be astronomical for the time. In the Battle of Creasy, Edward made history. For the first time, one army had defeated another primarily through the use of projectile weaponry rather than hand-to-hand -hand combat. Noble-born knights, extensively trained and expensively armoured for war, had been slaughtered at the hands of farmers and yeoman sons. Edward had defeated the best army in all of Europe, leaving the rest of the continent no choice but to take him, and thus England, much more seriously from then on out. Edward would follow up his success by besieging the city of Calais on the Channel Coast. Philip was powerless to prevent Edward from seizing the most well-fortified city in all of northern France, obtaining its surrender after a siege that ended in August 1347. The English would hold Calais for the next 200 years, using it as a forward operating base for attacks on France. This was part of a strategy that Edward had once described, stating the best way to avoid the inconvenience of war is to pursue it away from one's own country, meaning that the best way to keep England safe from attack was to keep the conflict within France's own territory. The war wound down the following year, however, as all of Europe grappled with a new, altogether more terrifying enemy, the Black Death. As much as 40% of the population of southern England died of the plague in 1348 alone, including two of the king's own children. King Philip himself would die in 1350, bringing the great rivalry between him and Edward to an ignominious end. Edward, meanwhile, largely withdrew from physically participating campaigns after Creasy, probably deciding he had nothing left to prove to anybody. Instead, he focused attention on domestic matters and taking plenty of time to relax and enjoy himself. Edward's court was known for its extravagance. Vast sums were spent on food, clothing, jewellery, and of course, the king's favourite pastime, hunting, falconry, and jousting tournaments. His court was known apparently for its sexual adventurousness. But Edward himself appears to have been entirely devoted to his queen, Philippa. Admittedly though, it's unlikely he would have had the time or energy for other pursuits, considering his wife bore him 12 children. His eldest son, Edward, known to history as the Black Prince of Wales, and known best to me for his cameo in A Knight's Tale starring Heath Ledger, would carry on the English military tradition, winning an arguably more important victory than Creasy in 1356 at the Battle of Poitiers. Not only did Prince Edward win, but the King of France, John II, was taken prisoner in the process. 
being brought to England and presented to his father. The French monarch joined the King of Scotland, David II, who had been imprisoned by the English since the capture of the Battle of Neville's Cross, while Edward was at Calais. King Edward was victorious on all fronts. He decisively beat his enemies, was respected by all of Europe, and loved by his people. But now he would remake England into his version of Camelot, embarking upon great building projects, including an extensive renovation of Windsor Castle itself, still used today as a royal residence. He would also employ some of the finest artists and poets of his era to create new and beautiful works for his buildings, few of which sadly survive to this day. This renaissance included the elevation of the English language itself, which sadly I am not continuing the tradition of because I speak with the common tongue. At the beginning of his reign, the language of the nobility was French, with official documents written in Latin. Now Edward became the first king to dictate that the court and parliamentary proceedings as well should be conducted in English, the language that most of his subjects spoke. To this end, he employed Geoffrey Chaucer, also known for his cameo in A Knight's Tale, where he's played by Paul Bettany, and in history is known as one of the greatest writers of English, and within decades, English would supplant French as the commonly spoken language by everybody in the country, from the king on down. I have to mention A Knight's Tale in this regard once again. I apologise for this if you've not seen it, although you probably should, it's really great. They have a, an amazing character moment which I think just typifies like, English sentiment towards the French, where um, uh, Heath Ledger and his crew were arguing with some French um, uh, nobles in a bar, where like the French decide to insult the English by saying, well, everybody knows that the Pope is French, to which um, uh, uh, I think it's Mark Addy, um, uh, Ro A.K. Robert Baratheon stands up and goes, okay, the Pope is French, but Jesus is English. It's just, yes. I just, that line always slayed me. Edward was a great lover of innovation. He paid for the first mechanical clocks to be built in England, including one set up at the Bell Tower at the Palace of Westminster, which chimed out on the hour every hour and is described as the original Big Ben. He built what was also probably the first bathroom in England to have both hot and cold running water, which was piped in from a neighbouring chamber where it was prepared. He also established the Order of the Garter, his answer to King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. In 1348, but perhaps his most enduring legacy was his embrace of St George as his patron saint. So devoted was he to this Christian martyr that his armies carried St George's, now iconic red and white cross, as one of their principal battle standards. This would become the flag of England itself eventually, and is still incorporated into the modern day flag of the United Kingdom. If anyone doesn't know, the, uh, the modern day flag of the United Kingdom um, combines the flags of England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's no dragon on there from the Welsh flag, and there have been calls in recent years to do that, because it would be awesome. Time is the enemy of all men, as the old saying goes, and so it was for King Edward. The last years of his reign were not happy ones. In 1360, he concluded the Treaty of Brittany with the French, in which he promised to announce his claim to the French throne in exchange for large territorial concessions. He also secured a massive ransom for King John II. For all intents and purposes, he'd won the war, but in 1364, John died, and with much of the ransom still unpaid. The new king, Charles V, was not prepared to accept his predecessor's failings in the loss of part of his inheritance, and so the war continued. This time, it was the English who were on the defensive, and Edward could only watch helplessly as most of what he gained was once again lost. Edward had now outlived his glory years, and he was an old man by medieval standards. His health began to fail him, and he was no longer able to take to the field to defend his realm. Worse still, he lived through the almost constant grief of watching his friends friends, relatives and loved ones die before he did. His companions from his younger days, including almost all of the founding members of the Order of the Garter, predeceased him. So did his mother, brother, both of his sisters and eight of his own children. His beloved wife, Philippa, died in 1369 and Edward took a mistress, Alice Perrot, who spent much of her time enriching herself and her friends at the king's expense. The final blow came in 1376 when his firstborn son and heir, the Black Prince, died after years of debilitating illness, rendered him as infirm as his father. In April 1377, the doddering old king, who reigned for some 50 years at this point, knighted his two 10-year-old grandsons, the future kings, Richard II and Henry IV, in a St George's Day ceremony. The two cousins would fight each other over the crown 20 years later, which set into motion the events of the War of the Roses in the 15th century, um, which for any like pop culture nerds out there is one of the inspirations for Game of Thrones. The War of the Roses between um, House York and House Lancaster, um, Starks, Lannisters, North, South. Two months later, Edward finally died of a stroke and was buried in an elaborate ceremony next to his queen at Westminster Abbey. In his wake, he left England forever changed by his kingship. England and France would fight each other on and off for over a century, as is tradition, with the French finally emerging victorious in 1453. 
The monarchs of England and Great Britain would keep the title King slash Queen of France in their names until 1802. A 450 year time span that would see the two nations contest each other for dominance on battlefields all over the world. It is a legacy that one of the greatest warrior kings in British history would probably appreciate. So thank you for tuning into this episode of Biographics. As noted at the start, I've been your interim host, Cal Smallwood. This video was based on an original article by Ben Adelman. Links to our socials can be found below. And yeah, thank you for tuning in. If you've enjoyed this video like, and you liked it, you can like it. If you want to comment on something I said, you can leave a comment. If you want to see more like this, you can subscribe. Um, if you want to see more of me, I'm not sure why you would, but I also host the sister channels for um, uh, the Top 10s Network, Top 10s and Geographics, again links to which you can find below, and also my own channels Fact Feed and Wiki Weekends. Otherwise, I hope everyone enjoyed and learned something today, and as always, have the day you all deserve. Also watch A Knight's Tale, it's a really good film. So you've got Heath Ledger, Mark Addy and Paul Bettany, what more could you want? Cheers.